We are actually in Romans. We just finished Romans 11. You survived the doctrinal section of Romans, although it was a lot of good stuff, wasn't it? But, but starting now, it's, it's like we reached the top of the roller coaster, now it's downhill. It's the practical living in Romans, Romans 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It's a lot of practical living. So, but Paul always sets it up with doctrine, and then he goes into the practical living. So that'll be next week. But I couldn't move on from last week chapter 11 without doing a, a, a f one more on Israel. And the title for today is What's Next for Israel? Two Prophetic Signs. And I'm going to focus mostly on Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38. Now we saw last week in Romans 11, we saw that uh, that there's, God still has a very important plan for the Jews and for Israel. A very important plan still, okay? Jesus the Messiah is returning to Jerusalem, Israel. He's coming to Jerusalem. That's where he's coming. If you missed last week, listen to it, because this is really part two for last week. But at that time, the entire Jewish remnant that survives is going to put their faith in the Messiah when Jesus Christ comes again at that very moment. It's going to happen. But first, the nation of Israel is going to have to go through the tribulation. Seven years of hell on earth. Uh, watch the Daniel Revelation series I did. Uh, 80 sermons, if you can get through them, it's worth it. Uh, but the Daniel Revelation series I did, it's online. Uh, you've, all the stuff is on the back of the bulletin, uh, all the different sites that you can follow along on that. But uh, when, when the, the, this time of the Great Tribulation is when the late great planet Earth will be ruled by a, a satanic ruler called the... Antichrist, yes, the Antichrist, but two prophetic events must happen first, which I want to look at today. Two things, and no matter when the rapture occurs, some we're all praying for an early one, aren't we? But whenever it is, whether it's beginning, middle, or end, whenever it is, uh, whenever it occurs, we could still see both, and I believe we will still see both of these prophetic events. Even if it's an early rapture, we would still see both of these prophetic events. And I hope that after today, you will start connecting the dots. You'll have God's word in one hand, and you'll have the You'll be following the news and you're, you know, on the phone or wherever you follow it. You know, you're well connecting the dots because it's amazing what has been happening. Once again, Daniel Revelation series. Let me pray again to get started. Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through your word now. As we look at your word, that the Holy Spirit would speak to us and prepare us and, and sharpen our faith. And Lord, if anybody has never put their faith in Jesus, that today would be the day of salvation for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so here we go. Russia has invaded the Ukraine, and they're going to do, do a lot more invading before they're finished. A lot, lot more. The Bible tells us that. But ultimately, they're going to lose. A lot of people are so upset about Putin and Russia. I go, don't worry, they're going to lose. I, mean, I don't know when it's going to happen, but they're going to lose big. They're going to lose big, uh, possibly while Putin is still in charge. They're, gonna, they're going to lose, uh, but not before they fulfill their prophetic purpose. Russia has a very important prophetic purpose in God's word, and they have to fulfill it. We may not like how it's being fulfilled. We might not like how it blows back on the United States, but, but they have a very, very important purpose. Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39, where we, we see Gog and Magog. But let's start, first of all, with Ezekiel 37, verse 1. Ezekiel 37, verse 1, it says this. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. You alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Powerful passage here. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them. 
and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the bones of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land, then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Wow. Just occurred to me that, Todd, you did miss a, you did miss a song that we could have sung tonight. Wow. Dem bones can rise again. <laughs> you guys know the beautiful spiritual? Dem bones can rise again. <laughs> Dem bones can rise again. Yeah, you, you missed that one. Dem bones. Dem bones. Yeah. Dry bones, dem bones, that's an awesome song. We used to sing it with the youth group all the time. So Ezekiel, this is this song is what it is about. Ezekiel says Israel will be regathered into the nation of Israel, the Jewish people into the nation of Israel. We saw this happen when? 1948, the miracle of 1948. No nation has ever disappeared for two thousand years and come back from the grave. It's never happened. It's impossible. Now half of the world's Jews live in Israel and the other half are thinking very seriously about coming back to Israel because of the war that just happened and because of the anti-Semitism and the hate that is breaking out all over the world, including the United States. It's, the majority of the Jews not living in Israel now are making plans to return. Crazy, crazy. And we know that Ezekiel here is talking about the end times regathering. We know that that is happening right now. We know it because let's look at Ezekiel 37 verse 21 where it says, and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations that where they have gone. I will gather them from all around the world and bring them back into their own land. And then look at verse 24. My servant David will be king over them. And they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Then the, then the nations will know that I the Lord make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. How do we know this is end times? Because King David is their king. And we know David's long gone. But who is he talking about, Ezekiel? He's talking about Jesus Christ, the son of David. Jesus fulfilled the King David. He was a type of picture of Jesus Christ who was going to come and, and fulfill. And so we know this is all going to happen after the second coming of Jesus Christ. We know that. We know that. This is all talking about the second coming and what's going to happen at the end. So we know this whole gathering and all that we're going to read about is end times. But before they can live heavily, happily ever after, as we see here in Ezekiel 37, they're going to have to go through many trials and, and tribulations and the great tribulation. They're going to have to go through the great tribulation. Ezekiel 38, after Ezekiel 37, he goes right into one of the major ones in Ezekiel 38 and 9. And let's pick it up here. And this is where it gets really interesting to today. All right. Ezekiel 38, 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Gog 
of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, prophesy against him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, Gog, chief, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Uh, let's see, where am I going to stop? I'll stop right there. Okay, so we see Gog and Magog. If you know anything about history and you look at the map, this is geographically Russia today. This is Russia today. The Prince of Meshach is also called the Prince of Rosh. It could be used either Meshach or Rosh. Russia will invade Israel. They're already mad at Israel today, right? Because what is Israel doing? They've stayed neutral in their war. They've stayed neutral, and that is ticking off Russia, and it's also ticking off a lot of the rest of the world, which we'll talk about in a little bit there. But uh, there, and also Russia is mad because who is Israel's closest ally? The United States. We're their closest ally so far. It's fading quickly, isn't it? Uh, but but we, you, you, that, that's why they're, they're already angry. And look how, what, who Russia brings with them. This is very interesting. Ezekiel 38, verse 4, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen, fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Cush, and Put will be with them, with all the, all with shields and helmets, also Gomer with all of its troops, and Beth Torgama from the far north with all its troops, the many nations with you. So we see he's going to be bringing this group. Uh, who's coming with them? Persia. What is Persia? If you look at the map, what is Persia today? Iran. Iran. Boy, it's hard to imagine them joining with Russia, isn't it? And coming against Israel. Isn't it hard to even picture, right? Uh, and also not just that, but Cush. Cush is Sudan, another militant Muslim nation. Also, uh, on top of that, we also have, uh, let's see, I'm losing my place here. Oh, um, uh, put. Here's a hard one. Libya, thank you, Libya, yes, uh, interesting. Libya, right, you've been following the war. And then, of course, Gomer is, what's that? Germany. Not Germany. Think Middle East, think Muslim, think Turkey. Turkey. Turkey is the main, the main one. Now, Turkey was always the missing piece. This is what puzzled prophetic students for years and years. And I remember thinking, I remember thinking 30 years ago, how could Turkey be in this? Because Turkey has been so pro-West. They're in NATO. They have applied for uh, membership in the European Union. They've been so pro-West. How could they be here? And But I kept, I kept telling people, listen, Turkey's going to go with it. And everybody's like, no, no, no. I go, Turkey is going to join. They have to because the prophetic word says Turkey's going with Russia. And, and nobody believed it. And now we have Erdogan running the show in Turkey. And Turkey has turned on the West. We've been doing this in our Connect the Dots group on Sunday nights. They've turned on the West. They, they're causing all kinds of issue in NATO. They're, they're like the, the black sheep of NATO. It doesn't look like they're going to stay in NATO for long. And they've also said, we don't care about the, You don't want to accept us in the European Union. We don't want to be in the European Union anymore. We like Russia a lot better. They're saying this. It's crazy, right? It's all setting up. It's all falling into place. It's just going to take a spark, a spark. And Putin, I just was reading a prophetic article, Putin has, I will read the headline, uh, Echoes of Ezekiel 38, Putin declares partnership with Islam in the new world order. He's trying to set up a new world order with them at the center, no longer in the United States. It's going to happen uh, for a little while. And these gathering these Muslims all around is exactly what we see in Ezekiel 38. Now, let's go back to Ezekiel 38, verse 7. Look what also happens. Get ready, be prepared, you and all the hordes gathered about you, and take command of them. After many days, you will be called to arms. God's doing this. In future years, you will invade a land that is recovered from war, whose people are gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They had been brought out of the nations, and now all of them live in safety. Verse 9, you and all your troops and the many nations with you will go up, advancing like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land. Wow. We just saw a part of this recently, right? October 7th, right? But uh, Israel is now established. A key prophetic peace has been set. I remember when I was a kid, 
remember this one pastor saying, nobody believes me, but Israel's going to be, you know, you know, nobody believed me. He was an older guy. He goes, when I used to preach that Israel would become a nation, he was a pastor back, way back. And he goes, no, everybody mocked me. <clears throat> everybody made fun of me, said it will never happen. He goes, but I stuck to my guns. And then 1948, I got the put it right back in their faces. You know? <laughs> he said, I was on top then. You know? but, but the point was, he stuck to the word of God. And, and it happened. No, very few people ever thought Israel could become a nation again. Never thought. Crazy, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, and, and so the key prophetic piece is set with Israel is, being, is, is established now. And the growing Islamic anger that is being talked about here toward Israel is also set. So we see both things are set. It's, it's all coming together, okay? Uh, what, why are the Muslims so upset with Israel? Well, they've always been upset with them, right? But, but they're extra upset because of what just happened with this war. You know, because Israel started this war and attacked all these. You know, yeah, yeah, you get my. That's what they believe. They really do believe that. It, it, it's crazy. But the, it's all set up. There's a, a rage, the Muslim Islamic rage toward Israel. It's always been there, but it's it's boiling up at this very moment, it, and it's all setting up unbelievably. Israel's established. Russia, you can see what Russia's become, and then you have the Muslim rage growing. And not let's not forget. <clears throat> Another key reason for the invasion, Ezekiel 38 verse 10 says this, another key reason. This is what the sovereign Lord says, on that day thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme. You will say, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and without gates and bars. Boy, does that sound like October 7th. Uh, I will plunder, here it is, I will plunder and loot and turn my hand against the resettled ruins and the people gathered from the nations, rich in livestock and goods, living at the center of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages will say to you, have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot? to carry off silver and gold, to take away livestock and good, and to seize much plunder, much plunder. This is another key. The plunder always puzzled me and puzzled everybody. What is Israel? They got, you know, they got olives, you know, and they've always had, you know, you know, they turned a desert into a garden, and there's a lot of positives, but there's no plunder in Israel, you know. They're the, they're the, you know, the poor kid on the block in a sense compared to Saudi Arabia and with all that they have. And then... What just happened? They found a natural gas bonanza. Israel is sitting on a natural gas bonanza. It's unbelievable what they have found and what they have now. It, 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 it's crazy. And now the European Union is mad at Russia, and they're turning off the spigot to Russia, right? You know, can't give Russia money, although most of the countries still bite under the table. But, but, but now they're turning to Israel. And the plan is to turn to Israel and have a lot of this energy replaced by their bonanza. And guess what, how Russia feels about that? <laughs> Putin's a good guy. He doesn't care. He is mad. They are mad. Russia is very angry with Israel right now. First of all, they stayed neutral, and now they're going to sell the natural gas to the European Union instead of them. And the Muslim allies already hate Israel. It didn't take much, right? The war now, but they already hate them. And, and, and so it's very easy to see how Russia will at some point move on from the Ukraine to Israel. We don't know when it will happen. Will be this year? Will be... 10 years, 20 years, we don't, we don't know, but it, it's going to happen. So Russia and the Muslim allies will invade Israel, but they're going to lose. And that's why I keep talking about it. Don't worry about it. Israel, Russia's going to lose. Sooner or later, they're going to lose. They're going to lose. Look, look at verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, this is what the sovereign Lord says, in that day when my people Israel are living in safety, will you not take notice of it? You will Come from your place in the far north, you and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. You advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land. In days to come, Gog, I will bring you. God's in charge. I will bring you 
against my land so that the nations may, may know me when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. This is what the sovereign Lord says. You are the ones I spoke of in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel. At that time, <clears throat> they prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. This is what will happen in that day when Gog attacks the land of Israel. My hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord. In my zeal and fiery wrath, I will declare that at that time, Time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment on him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstone, and burning sulfur on him and on his troops and on the many nations with him. And so I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Now understand, this is not the Battle of Armageddon. This is just Russia and the Muslim allies. The Battle of Armageddon is when we see in Revelation where all the nations, including the United States or what's left of it, will join an attack on Israel with the Antichrist. That's a whole different battle. But this is what leads up to that time. This is what leads up to the tribulation. And what we see here <clears throat> is what, what happens here is God will miraculously, this is Gog, Magog, Ezekiel 38, God will miraculously deliver Israel. If you, we, We're not going to get into Ezekiel 39 today, but it's even more detail. And notice I said God will deliver Israel. It doesn't say the United States will deliver Israel. What is all the chatter now? The United States, we need the United States. The United States is the best friend. You know, President Biden, we will always stand with you. Oh, <clears throat> I guess not. You know, it, it, it's, 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 it, it, the United States is not going to deliver them. Where will we be in all this? Where do you see the United States in this? Nowhere. Uh, nowhere. Maybe we try to help and we lose, right? Maybe, maybe that happens. Or maybe we were going to sit this one out. Can you imagine that? We're going to sit this one out. Already half of the country is anti-Israel. The studies have shown over and over half of our country is now anti-Semitic. They're against Israel. Half the country. Even the church is losing it. Jerusalem Post. You want to know what's really going on? Read the Jerusalem Post. It's not Christian. It's not our media. It's the Jerusalem Post. And you know what? They're, the even... <clears throat> Even, listen to what they say. Young, this is Jerusalem Post. Young evangelical support for Israel plummets. Jerusalem Post. Support for Israel among young evangelicals has plummeted by over 50% in just three years, posing a potential threat to American backing for the Jewish state. In 10 to 20 years, when Israel finds itself in need of emergency American aid, there might not be anyone left there to offer it. This is in the Jerusalem Post. As of late 2021, only 33% of young evangelicals under 30 support Israel, compared to 67% in 2018. At the same time in 2021, 24.3% of young evangelicals said they support the Palestinians, compared to only 5% three years before. You see what is happening. The woke church is bearing its fruit. It's just unbelievable. It, and why are the young evangelicals turning against Israel? Because their pastors have been unfaithful in the pulpit. They are not preaching God's prophetic word. They, 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 they've gone woke. Or even if they do believe it, they're, they're, they're carefully preaching and silent because they don't want to offend anybody. And that's just as bad as the false teaching. It's just as bad. It's functional false teaching. I, I've talked to more Christians from all over, and I said, what, are your, what is your pastor saying about Israel and what's going on? They don't even mention it. Haven't mentioned it. That's why the young evangelicals are, are, are crumbling biblically. And it's very scary because Genesis 12, 3 says what? I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the nations, all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. But I'm going to bless those who bless Israel, and I'm going to curse those who curse them. 
And maybe by this time when we get to Gog and Magog, maybe the United States has been judged. Maybe we've been fractured, breaking up into several countries. There's a lot of talk about that, right? Uh, maybe we've been attacked. Maybe in, internally we've been attacked because s somehow maybe a few terrorists have snuck in. <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we're paralyzed. Maybe we're paralyzed. Maybe uh, it, uh, to collapse as a country. Read Daniel and Revelation. We are not there. If we're the lone superpower in the world, how can we not be in Daniel and Revelation? Because something has happened. Maybe, maybe uh, we, we cross 30, 40, million, $40 trillion in debt, right? Sooner or later, it's going to collapse. But all I know is we're not there. But this is the thing. Israel will survive. They don't need us. They will be miraculously saved by God, by God. But somehow at this point, the European Union, which has now become the revived Roman Empire, whenever you see the revived Roman Empire in scripture, the Re Re European Union is that. It's completely the same thing. Even the, even the 12 stars on the European Union flag, it's a complete counterfeit. It's unbelievable. But the, at some point, the revived Roman Empire is going to emerge as the top dog. Right now, the United States is that, but somehow the European Union is going to become. Remember, when did the United States become top? After World War II. We emerged, and, and Europe was in disarray and shambles, and the United States emerged as this superpower that stood against the USSR. Finally, the USSR dissolves, and we became the lone superpower. But, but what's going to happen is this. It's just like we emerged after World War II. After this war, the European Union, the revived Roman Empire, is going to emerge. And guess who's going to emerge with it? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. He's going to emerge with it as a worldwide savior. And Daniel Revelation tells us that he will, uh, will make a deal with Israel, a deal of peace. He's going to finally solve that thorny Israel peace problem in the Middle East. He's going to solve it. He's going to solve it. And he will try to work it out. He will work it out so that the Jews can rebuild their temple. The third temple is going to be rebuilt. Maybe a war happened. Maybe it's because of the war. Maybe missiles hit that temple site. You know, it, it almost happened. Did you know Hamas actually shot missiles at the temple site? And Israel, they used their intercept to, to knock them down. And I was like, why did they do it? We could have been seven years from Jesus, you know? <laughs> But they actually saved it. But this time, maybe they don't save it. Maybe this earthquake that you saw flattens the mosque, right? The mosque up on the Temple Mount flattens it. And we don't know, but somehow it's going to be removed, and the temple will be rebuilt, which is the second major prophetic event to watch for. First is Russia, invasion of Israel. The second one that we're watching for, and I'm watching, is the temple will be rebuilt. It has to be. It has to be, because Jesus is coming back to the temple. He's going to clean it out again. He's going to have to, because wait till you see what the Antichrist does. He's going to clean house again. There are so many prophecies about Jesus coming back to Jerusalem and back to the temple. People that deny this, so this replacement theology, false teaching that's out there, the, the, the ones who deny that, you, you have to not believe in the second coming then, because that's where Jesus is coming to. It's going to happen. And uh, it, it, there's so many prophecies. And when it happens, put on your seatbelt. Because when, this, when you see the, the temple being rebuilt, the foundation laid, the, you can count on either the, the rapture or seven more years. We don't know. We, we always say we hope for an early rapture, but we prepare. You know, we pray for the early one. We prepare for the mid or, or post trip too. But, but it's either going to be time for the rapture or we're going to have seven more years, a uh, maximum seven more years on this planet. The Antichrist will allow the temple to be rebuilt, but he's really doing it for himself. In Daniel 9.27, it says this. He will confirm, I'll talk about the Antichrist, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And the, at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. He, we know from Daniel Revelation, he's going to actually set up his own image in the temple and demand that it be, he be worshipped in that temple. And not just there. Everybody's going to have to take the mark of the beast and worship him also. 
Just like the Roman emperors who persecuted the Christians before them. They all had to worship the emperor as God. Same thing is going to be happening here. The Antichrist is going to do it. He's going to break his treaty. After three and a half years, he's going to break the treaty. He's going to set up his image to be worshipped halfway through. He's going to viciously persecute the Jews because the Jews aren't going to like it. They're not going to like it. He's going to viciously persecute them just like he has been per persecuting the Christians leading up to this, just like the spear of the Antichrist is persecuting the Christians right now. There's never been worldwide persecution like right now. Never. Anything close to it. We're sitting in our cushy little America that's going to come to an end. But the rest of the world, the Christians, what they're going through is unbelievable. Voice of the Martyrs. Open door, read, follow these stories. It's unbelievable. But he's going to persecute the Jews. Watch my Daniel Revelation series if you haven't done it. What in the world is happening? 82 sermons. All during COVID. I was very busy. All right, during that whole shutdown. All right, so now let's play, let's play something here. Let's play what if it were right now. If it were right now, who would be the Antichrist? There's only one person. That fits it right now. Now, this could be five years and be totally different, but right this very second could only be Zelensky. It's the only one. Because Zelensky has Jewish blood, which Daniel says he has to have Jewish blood, but he has to have a form of Christianity, and Zelensky has a form of Christianity. It's a very uh, loose form of it, all right? Uh, and this is the other thing. He has to be super popular. Who is the one popular person in the world right now that can then that could unite the West at least it's only Zelensky I'm not listen a year from now could be someone totally different I'm just playing, showing you how to connect dots okay just showing you how to connect the dots it could be totally different very quickly but right this moment you, you watch the European Union rallies and Zelensky shows up and it's like you know Elvis and uh, you know reincarnated it's crazy they they just go gaga over Zelensky you know and it's crazy and he's already mad at Israel not only is Russia mad at Israel but Zelensky's really ticked at Israel because they have stayed neutral how can you stay neutral? You know, you could, he's very, very upset with him. He, he's holding a grudge right now, and he's, and, and he's also showing signs of being a pretty controlling guy. He canceled elections in the Ukraine. Did you know that? To save democracy. He's canceled elections. <laughs> you got to love that, right? Babylon B had so much fun with that one. But anyway, but, but now listen, Zelensky, but I'm just showing you how to connect dots. Zelensky or someone like him. Oh, we like Zelensky. Yeah, that's the whole point. We're all going to like, you know, the Antichrist is going to be very popular. You're going to have to be discerning. It's going to fool even the elect if that were possible, Jesus says. Someone like him will rise to the top to save the world, to unify us. Okay? That is what's going to happen. All right. What should we be doing? Once again, a year from now, it could be somebody totally different, but just, I'm just giving you an idea how to connect dots. What should we be doing? Well, Paul tells us, remember Paul from Romans, tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, he says, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. What should we be doing? Huh? What should we be doing? Looking up. That's what we should be doing. Constantly looking up. We're looking up. Jesus is coming back soon. The signs are here. And Jesus said, I will come quickly. The word quickly in Greek is, literally means suddenly. It's going to be sudden. He didn't mean he's going to come back any day quick. He meant suddenly when, 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 when we least expect it. Keep looking up. Listen, our hope in the United States is not an election. I hate to tell you this, but whoever gets elected, we're, we're in a lot of trouble. We're, we're, we're under judgment. No matter what, we're under judgment. Hate to disappoint anybody looking forward to something either way. Listen, what was God's final straw 
Remember we did the life of Elijah and the life of Elisha? What was God's final straw when he finally judged the nation? What was the last straw? Child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. The shedding of innocent blood, the child sacrifice we saw in both Elijah and Elisha, that was the last straw. Sacrificing these children to Baal and to Moloch. Unbelievable. The last straw. The United States has sacrificed 60 million babies. 60 million. We are on the last straw. There's no doubt. The USA is imploding. It doesn't take any, anybody can see that. But don't get mad. Don't mope. Don't fret. So many people are like, oh, if the USA disappears, what are we going to do? Uh, really? We're Christians. Yes, grieve, because we love our country, and we remember what it was like, you know, 50 years ago. I can remember that. But, but remember where our true citizenship is. Philippians 3.20, when Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our citizenship. That's who we're looking to, 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 to win the presidency, the real presidency, the ruler of the world. That's, that's who we're looking for. And we have to look up. We have to look up. And while we're looking up, we need to look out. Look out. Watch out. First Thessalonians 5, 1 to 4, a couple of verses later. Now, brothers and sisters, we do not need to... Uh, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. I'm trying to read this one because I have different versions that going on in my head here. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Notice that we don't know the date. We can't figure that out. But it shouldn't surprise us when Jesus does come, right? Because we saw it coming. We saw the signs biblically and happening all around us. It shouldn't surprise us. We should see it coming. We should be looking out. We should be looking out for that. We should see it coming. We need to connect the dots. I keep talking about that, connecting the dots. Daniel, Revelation, Matthew 24, Mark 13. And in and, and, and order to look up, and this is another thing, to look up and to look out, we must have our eyes open. We must wake up. Look up, look out, and then eyes open, we have to wake up. First Thessalonians, next verse. First Thessalonians, I love that. What a passage. Verse 5. 5-5, five, five. you are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. We are sons and daughters, children of light. And we're, he calls us here to live like it, to live these holy lives, to live lives that draw us, other people, to Jesus Christ. It's going to get hot. It's getting worse by the minute. The persecution, what churches being attacked and bombed, firebombed. In the United States, it happens all the time. I'm sure you saw that on CNN. But uh, it's happening. Churches are being attacked unbelievably. It, it, it's crazy, uh, it, it, but we still have a job to do. We don't, oh, the United States, and oh, we we'll get away from it. We can't do it. We have a job to do. We have a very important job to do while we're here. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. He's, I'm just going to hit, you are the salt of the earth. Then down a little further, it says, you are the light of the world. All right? You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Salt flavors, and it also slows down the rot. That's our job. We got to slow down the rot. I, you know, listen, the school here, New Hope Sober, went over the edge. It's off the cliff. But I tell people, you know what? For a long time, it didn't because, you know what? I fought, and a lot of you fought with me. Remember going to the principal and the superintendent and the school board and fighting to keep that garbage out. And we fought for a long time. About 10 years, we held it off. Now it's a, it's a tsunami now. Don't even get me started what's happening there. 
That's why my kids aren't there. It's crazy, but that's our job is to slow down the rot as long as we can and also to be the light, show the light of Jesus Christ, show people the way to Jesus Christ. That is our job. We can't focus on how dark it's getting. Just focus on how bright we can shine now, right? That should be our whole focus, right? That, that's the goal. And don't forget Genesis 12, 3 in the midst of this. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. We have to keep blessing Israel and the Jews. Don't buy the lies, the spirit of the Antichrist out there, that, that, you know, that the Antichrist is driving this whole train, anti-Semitism and, and how Israel's the oppressor and, and the, you know, these, you know, just these, all these lies. God gave the land of Israel to the Jews, and there's a lot more that they're going to get. It's not just Gaza. It's not just West Bank. You look at the biblical map. It's huge compared to what they have right now. It belongs to God's people. Don't buy the lies. Christians, are we, are we looking up? Are we looking out? Are we, are we awake? Are our eyes open? Daniel Revelation, once again, listen. Are we, are we living like we're ready for that? That has to be our whole focus here. Are we, are, we, are we living like we're ready to see Jesus either here, there, or in the air? <laughs> yeah, here, here, there, or in the air. Somewhere we're going to see him. Are we, are we ready? Are we living like we're ready to see him? And, 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 and maybe you're here and you're not a Christian yet. Are you ready to see him? If you're not a Christian yet, you are not. You, you won't be ready for the second coming until you act on the first coming. And the way we act on the first coming is we put our faith in Jesus Christ. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Life. God gave his son Jesus to die on the cross. He shed his blood to pay for our sin. He rose again to give us a brand new life, to justify us and give us a brand new life. That's what God did. He gave us his son. We have to believe on him. The word believe in the Greek, it means to put your faith and to trust and to cling to, completely trusting in what Jesus did for us. Have you ever given your life to Jesus and put your faith in him? Are you ready? And it's not just Jesus coming. Listen, are we ready? I lost a good friend this week. Died. Died. But it hit me that we are all one breath, one heartbeat away from eternity. Are we ready? Are we ready for Jesus to come again? Let's pray. As we go to this time of prayer, how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Maybe we bought the world's lies or we've been, been conformed. We're going to see this next week. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How, is, how do we need to be transformed? Through God's word, through the Holy Spirit. How have we been conformed, but we're going to say, no, God, I need to be transformed. What do we need to break free of to live these holy lives? What do we need to do specifically? What, what, whatever it takes to be a light for Jesus Christ, to draw people. These are dark times. People have no hope. Imagine living without God. That's what they're living. They're living in despair, in anger, in shame. We have Jesus to share with them. The real Jesus, not the Jesus who gets us, not the Jesus who washes our feet no matter what we do, the Jesus who said to the sinful woman, go and sin no more, the real Jesus. He didn't throw the stone, but then he said, go and sin no more. He said to the paralytic, you're healed, but stop sinning or something worse is going to happen. That's the real Jesus.
we have the power of the Holy Spirit to help people break free of their sin and the lies and the deceptions. Will we speak the truth and love? Will we be salt and light? How is God speaking to us even now? How is he calling us to be salt or to be light somewhere or in someone's life? And while we're praying about that, I want to encourage those who have never put their faith in Jesus. You've never surrendered your life. You are not ready for the second coming because you've never acted on the first coming. You can do that now. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Are you ready to put your faith in Jesus? To have real life now and forever. You can have that this very moment. It happens in our heart. We put our faith in Jesus in our heart. But I encourage people to, to pray a prayer of faith to put an exclamation point on that. The simple prayer of faith we see over and over in God's word. God, I repent I repent of everything in my life that goes against your word, your will, your purpose for my life. I repent. I ask you to forgive me. Because I'm putting my faith in Jesus. your one and only son who died for me, who rose again for me. I put my trust, my faith, my hope in him. I give my life to you, God. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, whether you're sitting in here or out in your car or at home or wherever you are, if you've put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit has come into you and made you a brand new creation in Christ, a brand new person. Your life will never be the same, and I want to encourage you to tell somebody today, don't let this day end without telling another Christian what you've done so that we can encourage you and be excited for you. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take your word from today and take it forward in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.